think I'm ready. Hello? Oh, that's loud. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. How was lunch? <laughs> not, so you're not all asleep from the food coma. That's good. Um, okay. Well, let me tell you about someone very special. I'm about to introduce you to Martin. Martin's a Googler hi hailing from Zurich. He's a lovely person, and I recommend you talk to him after his talk. And he's going to tell us a little bit about SEO, especially the technical side, and how you can go about it. So I'm not going to steal the stage for too long. <laughs> so take it away, Martin. Thank you very much, Ramon. Oh, I forgot my microphone, which I think I need for the uh, stream mostly, because I'm speaking very loud anyways. But yeah, let's give the, oh, yeah. the people on the recording or whatever we are doing. I'm not sure if we're streaming or recording. I think we're recording, right? OK. All right. OK, cool. Ah, so as Ramon said, um, my name is Martin Schlitt. I work as a webmaster's trends analyst at Google. It's a really weird title, but technically it's just a developer advocacy. So my role is to figure out what we can do better internally to help you get into Google search, um, and then also help you build better stuff on the web so that you get easy, more easily into Google search. I'm based in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, originally, I'm from Germany, from Hanover. That's, okay. that's really, really awkward. Um, <laughs> but doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. So I love cute animals and all sorts of animals. People ask me, like, are you a dog person or a cat person? And I say, why not both? So I really, really enjoy that. But also, and that comes with my job, kind of. That's one of the reasons I got hired, I believe, is I really, really enjoy the web as a platform. I think it's the most fantastic platform we've got because it works on all platforms. It works on all kinds of devices. As long as you have a browser, you have access to it. And you're pretty much unrestricted by most of the things. And there's no gatekeeping happening. So basically, if you have a computer that is connecting to the internet, you don't need anything else to host something on the web. Well, it is convenient to have a domain. It is convenient to have a server or some sort of hosting. But basically, it's just that. Have something that is on the internet and allows you to have HTTP traffic to it. So that's, that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, and yeah, so as I said, I love cute animals. And I have plenty of images of uh, doggos and puppers. These are only some of them. And they are all so cute. Ah, I only met this one in person, but like all of them are super cute, and, and Momo is particularly nice. And so I thought, I want to share this with everyone. Why don't I share all the beautiful doggos and puppers that I've got available? And um, the easiest way to me, well, for me to share this with as many people as possible is to build a website. Because as I say, this platform is so open and available to pretty much everyone with a browser that it makes it the perfect target to share with other people and collaborate. So you might just go, OK, um, I only have so many images of Doggos and Puppers, so I can just like build a little website either statically or using a static site generator or whatever. And then I end up with HTML like this. And you see, like, OK, so we have the title here, cutest doggos. Um, we have a random doggo of the day. And then we have a link to a page with more information on this doggo. This doggo is apparently called Molly and has an image. Cool. And then there's more doggos down here. Fantastic. But you know, I want to share this with everyone, but I also want to have a little bit of a benefit from it. I mean, you know, having a yacht is kind of nice. Or um, I'm not really that much into sports cars, so I'm not that much into, like, I could say, like, a Ferrari, but I don't really care about that. Also, good food is actually pretty expensive in Switzerland, so, you know, got to pay for this somehow. But unfortunately, when you just put your website up these days, you're not necessarily getting what you wanted. So I, I wanted to share with people the joy of cute doggos and puppers. But that didn't happen. <laughs> so that's not making me happy. And I guess if you're building stuff for the web, you also want people to see it, to use it, to interact with it, rather than to just it being lingering on the internet with no one looking at it, right? So how do people find websites normally? And I mean, my website's new. And um, I'm not Facebook or Google or Apple or whatever, so people are not just typing my brand name in uh, and find me right away. So what do they do? Well, you know, most of the new websites I discover in my day-to-day -day life, I discover through a search engine. I am not looking for some specific website. I'm looking for something that I want or need at this point in time. In every morning when I wake up, which is usually much too early, because there's no such thing as a good morning, um, I want to have something nice. So I might just go like for cute doggos or cute puppers. 
and I go to the search engine of my choosing and there's many interesting ones to choose from. There's like DuckDuckGo and Yahoo and Bing and this startup from Mountain View that I work for. Um, that's called Google. So I basically go there and I type something in and then I find something. Usually these responses or these results are pretty good. And then I tap on one and then I have my experience that I wanted or my, the purpose that I uh, set out for is fulfilled. And I have a good morning, surprisingly, uh, because I looked at cute doggos and puppers. The problem is that I'm not the only one doing the thing. There's many people competing for what I'm trying to accomplish. And that's probably the case for most of what you're, you will be doing. You might be the best at it, but that doesn't matter if you're one out of 2.68 million results. So you want to figure out how can I make sure that people are not just finding some website from someone else because I have the cutest doggos and puppers. So I want people to find my website specifically. And one way to do that is SEO, search engine optimization. Now, who has heard this beforehand? Who has worked with an SEO? Who thinks SEO is a terrible, terrible thing? Well, there's, a, there's a few people uh, raising their hands and I hope to convince you otherwise. So the thing is, there's obviously, as in developers, there's good developers, there's bad developers, there's also good SEOs and bad SEOs. And um, a few people have historically tried to game the system and go like, haha, what we'll do at the very early days of the internet, we'll just like put all the keywords into our website and then we're going to be found for all the keywords and maybe we are selling, I don't know, uh, cheap medicine or cheap drugs or something and we're just going to put on like golden watches and uh, public transport in Vienna and whatnot and then we're going to rank and people are going to click on it and then we're going to be rich and filthy. Um, that's not really working anymore. So most of these black hat techniques are actually uh, inefficient. Well, actually all of them because at some point we're going to discover what people are doing and then we do countermeasures for this. All search engines do this kind of thing. But there's also legitimate SEOs that try to help you be successful in a way that also benefits your users. So basically, good SEO is trying to figure out who should be on your website and how to get them there. And then you provide the right content and then basically magically is a match. So it is a bit of magic, but it is good magic if done right. And actually, it's not that much magic. So let's talk about a few things. The one, number one thing that I want to make clear here is you can do everything right on the technology side, but still not rank well or show up in search results. And that's because what you then have is a polished turd. It's a pile of poo that shines brightly, but it's still a pile of poo. So the number one concern you should have is your content. If you're not having great content, it's not going to help you. And what do I mean when I say great content? Well, what I mean when I say great content is you want to make sure that you are using the language of people who are looking for what you're offering. If you are offering uh, fantastic furniture for offices that is very healthy and very nice, try to like, get into office furniture just puts you with all the rest of the competition. But what you're trying to accomplish and what people who need your or want your furniture to try, what they are trying to accomplish is more healthier office furniture or healthier um, workforce in the office. And then you can say like, well, if you, you know, one of the main reasons why people are feeling sick and tired in the office might be bad furniture. So we help you design the solution that, you know, basically give them what they are looking for. I want to make life of my employees better. And then your furniture might be one way of doing so. Right? Why am I giving all these people cute doggos and puppers? I, wanna have them, or I want them to have a fantastic day and look at cute animals. So figure out what your goal is and what are people then using, what terms, what words are people using to figure out where to find this. And then you have to speak the same language on your website and you have to make sure that you give them good information and not like some random bullshit. So once you have that settled and you have great content, you want to make sure that people get this content as quickly as possible. And this is where the technology bit starts to set in. Having a website with fantastic content that takes ages to load, it's not going to be great either, right? We all know that, especially if you're in, in a U-Bahn or something, and then the Wi-Fi flake or the, the mobile network flakes out. Um, 
it is good if the, this content shows up anyways and not you have to wait until uh, basically you're back on the surface and then still wait like a minute or two to actually get the content. So make sure that your website performs well. That's a usability or user experience issue as well as an SEO issue. If your website is slow, that is bad. You might actually rank lower in Google because it's one of over 200 different ranking signals. So we are probably ranking faster websites higher than your website, even if the content is more or less the same. Then you want to stand out. What? Now we're going to do that at the end because there's like a bunch of explanations here. Um, right, you want to stand out from the search results. Your search result is one of many and you want to make sure that the user understands why yours is the better one from all of the, the results you got and why they should click on yours and not on the other ones. You might be the first search result but sometimes you don't click on the first search result because it sounds weird or not as good. Like let's say you type in some specific name, you type in my name, you might Depending on many factors, you might find the Twitter page from me as the first result. But you're like, I don't care. I want to see this guy's, I don't know, LinkedIn profile or uh, web personal website or blog or whatever. So basically, you might not go for the first one because the title says it's a Twitter feed and you're like, yeah, whatever. No, I don't, I don't care about this. So you want to make sure that your titles make sense. Oh, yeah, okay, I, I have to like, um, explain it this way. So I, sorry, I, I took out a few slides because I thought it's too much, but actually I think it, I have to explain this. So basically, if you have uh, different pages with different content, which normally you have, make sure that the title makes clear what this particular page is about. Let's say I have a blog. If all my ti page titles for all my blog posts are just Martin Splitt's blog, that's not helpful because that's what's going to show up. I, I search for like, how do I rank well on Google Technical SEO? And I have a blog post that says exactly that. But in the search result, it just says like Martin Splitz blog. You're like, nah, maybe not. But then you click on the article that says how to rank better with technical SEO. So I have to make sure that my title is relevant to the ex uh, um, separate pages. I have to make sure that I have titles that update and change depending on the content that I've got. This is also possible in single page applications. If you use Angular or React, you can totally do that as well. Also, we show a little snippet below the title, so you get a little bit of space to describe what this is about. So for instance, if you have a recipe and you say like grandma's apple pie, then there's probably lots of recipes that are called grandma's apple pie. But if you in the description tell the user, this is a very simple recipe that can be done with very few ingredients and within 10 minutes, which is a challenge, I guess then that might be the exact thing that they are looking for. And if there's another snippet where it just says like grandma's apple pie, then you're like, yeah, maybe I go for this one because I know that it's going to be quick and with fewer ingredients probably. So make sure that each of your pages have um, a relevant title and a relevant description snippet. Okay, now that we have identified how we can rank a little better, the question becomes, or the question changes a little bit to how do I make sure that Google sees my pages? How do I make sure that it finds them so that it can expose the users to these pages? And we have a little friend here that is Googlebot. And um, Googlebot is really nice and friendly, and this is our tool to basically crawl and index the web. Now, what do, do, you, blah, what do these two things mean? Well, you know, there's a first stage, which is the crawling stage. What crawling means is we get a URL, so we start from a set of URLs that we happen to know, and then we look at links, and so on and so forth. So we find URLs, and then what we do is we pass these into the crawler, which is behaving basically like a browser, a very simple browser. It just downloads whatever is at that URL. So it gets some HTML down from the wire, um, and then what it does, it goes, okay, so here, Part two, indexing. Here is some HTML for you. Figure out what this is. And then Googlebot goes, okay, so this page is about, you know, doggos and stuff and has a bunch of images and it has a bunch of links. There's this doggo that is called uh, Molly and then there's more doggos here. And then it finds these links and passes that back to crawling. So these pages will get downloaded and then we look at the content again. And basically what we're doing is what a library would do as well. So if in the library you go to the clerk and ask, hey, or librarian rather clerk, um, you ask the librarian, hey, I want a book on cats. Then the librarian probably has a catalog that says under cats, which books are containing information about cats. And this is what we are doing. Basically, we take a note what the website is about and put that into a database. And then later on, when someone comes and asks us for a website on cute doggos and puppers, 
we'll find the websites that we have crawled beforehand and put in the index as doggos and puppers. So these steps basically keep running. It's an oversimplification as we're going to see soon, but basically that's what we're doing. But if you look at that, that works basically like this. So here we have the crawled output, we have a bunch of text, we have a bunch of links, uh, we look at the links in the second stage, and then we crawl again and then we figure out, okay, so there's doggosandpuppers.com, which is about the best doggos and puppers, then there's an, a specific dog, then there are more dogs, and then there are some puppers probably as well, linked from somewhere. So we basically go through the internet like that. But this is great and this is fine and we are in the search index now and everything's fantastic, but the world has changed a little bit. Who here works with the JavaScript framework? That's what I thought. It actually doesn't matter which one you are picking. Um, any framework basically more or less gives you a workflow more or less like this, where you can say like, okay, um, I want to create a new application and then I'm starting some sort of development cycle in the local server and look at what I'm doing and then I make a production build and I deploy that somehow. And that's great. The downside of that is that our content changes a little bit. So this is the content that the crawler would see if it would still work the way that I explained it earlier on, right? So wh what is this website about? Clearly doggos and puppers. No idea how I would find that one out from here because the only relevant bit is the app root. So Googlebot wouldn't like that, right? Because now we can't really index anything. We don't know which websites are about which content, which kind of thing, what purpose do these websites serve? So we have to do something slightly different. And that's why Googlebot works in a different way. So the question that I often get is like, so is it true that Googlebot does run JavaScript or not? It is true, Googlebot does run your JavaScript, but not right away. So we are deferring this until we have the resources available to do so, because rendering is actually not free, surprisingly, right? Rendering actually costs a lot of resources, and then you might go like, yeah, but come on, I mean, you're Google, why, why is that a problem? And the answer is that the web is pretty big. So in 2016, we saw 130 trillion documents. That's a large number, a very large number. And that was 2016, and the web is growing, so um, I have no idea what the actual numbers these days are, but somewhere north of that, definitely. So we have a lot of things to crawl. We have a lot of things to look at and render. So hmm, how are we doing this? Well, the way we do this uh, is actually slightly more complicated. So we start again with a URL that goes into the crawler. The crawler fetches the HTML as it is downloaded, and then, then goes into a stage that is between the indexing and the crawling, which is the processing stage. There's like this is a simplification, this is a very complicated and highly asynchronous process, but basically this is more or less what happens behind the curtain. In the processor, we look at the HTML that we already got and see if we find any links, because that means we can already enqueue them to be crawled at a later point in time. So we don't even have to render if we already found links, we can immediately start like crawling. Crawling can take a while as well, because as I said, the web is big and we don't have infinite resources, so also crawling has some delays sometimes. And, um, it is kind of useful to basically say, oh, we have links already. We know that we're going to crawl them in a, in a very near future, so we can already enqueue them so that they get crawled as soon as possible. And then we pass the HTML on to the renderer. This is basically a headless Chrome. This is a browser that runs on our server infrastructure, and this browser is unfortunately right now a somewhat outdated version of Chrome, but we are working on rolling out a newer version, and we are towards being up to date with the Chrome versions as they come out. But basically, eventually, once the resources are available, so this can take a while until the queue is, is empty and we are ready to go into rendering for this page, we get the rendered HTML back, and obviously there will probably be, if it's a single page application specifically, there will be more links, so we enqueue these links for discovery and crawling and indexing as well. And once we have the content, we can finally index things. None of this has anything to do with ranking. This does not mean that you are, if your website uh, requires a, a rendering stage down here um, because it's a single page application that your page will not rank high. That's not the case. There's two separate steps, right? The ranking bit is a lot, lot later. So all we care is about indexing because in the index, being in the index means having a book in the library. And people can only find this book in the library if it is in the library. 
they might not necessarily choose it over another book, but that's a completely different story. The, so far, all we care about is being found. And the indexing is not that much dependent on JavaScript, but clearly if your content only appears after rendering, then it can take a little longer for us to find your content. If you're a news website that has content that changes very often, that is not fantastic, but there's ways around it. So here's a few more technical tips. So this was basically like the setup so far and um, should help you a little bit to understand what's going on in terms of, of search and SEO. But now it gets a little more technical. So I think one way that is definitely helpful and not just for search engines, but also for user experience is to not entirely rely on client-side rendering. I highly recommend hybrid rendering because it is the fastest and the best of both worlds in, in many cases. Server-side rendering is another way of doing that, but you might actually encounter a few like drawbacks uh, where single-page apps have like nicer ways of, for instance, having transitions between different pages and stuff like that. You lose that normally um, when you do server-side, pure server-side rendering. So the server-side rendering is basically just you take the JavaScript that you wrote and that can be React, Angular, whatever, and run it on your server that creates some content, usually HTML, and then you transmit that. And the cool thing is, if this output doesn't change very often, you can cache this. So basically, you generate this once, um, and if you already know this page only updates every week or every two weeks or every month, you can basically keep that around and you, you save the cost of doing all this work here. You can straight away serve the content directly to the browser, and that is really nice, and uh, you don't rely on JavaScript, which needs to be downloaded, parsed, and executed before you get to the actual content. So you basically have uh, a fast and, and good solution for your users, but the usability or the user experience might suffer a little bit because what you get is basically a static website. So then the question becomes, why would I even go this far and use JavaScript here? Why not build a static page in the first place? Then hybrid rendering is similar to that it basically does the JavaScript rendering on the server side already and creates the content that again, if we can cache that, that's fantastic as well. But it also means that we get the content right into the browser when the user requests it. And by the way, unlike uh, JavaScript parsing, HTML parsing is progressive, which means the moment it discovers an image, for instance, it starts downloading. Unlike JavaScript, where the entire JavaScript has to be downloaded first and then parsed and then executed, right? So we get the progressive parsing, so the content comes in as quickly as it can um, if we are doing the HTML right. But then we still download some JavaScript to upgrade basically. So we have a static website at that point, and now we download some JavaScript that intercepts the links and all these wonderful things and adds transitions and animations and whatnot, and um, also allows us to download more content as we, as we need it. If this JavaScript here would fail or not download correctly, that's not a problem because the content probably still has link tags in there, and we would just do like an entire fresh refresh again and go back to the server. That's not the best usability, but it is still better than not having any content. So I think hybrid rendering is pretty much the best of both worlds. It, it has the benefits of server-side rendering with the benefits of having a client-side rendered single page app. And there's a different set of, of tools that you can use. Angular, um, if you use server-side technologies that are supported, has Angular Universal. Um, and depending on your application, that is very easy to um, implement or sometimes a little harder to implement. But basically, that gives you hybrid rendering for your Angular application. If you're using React, then Next.js is a great framework to help you using your React applications in a hybrid way. If you're using Vue.js, which is pretty popular and my personal favorite so far um, of these frameworks, then you can rely on Next.js, which is basically uh, Next.js cloned for Vue.js. And if you're using Polymer, consider using Rendertron um, to server-side render your content. It's not really hybrid rendering, though. Then, if you don't want to make code changes, but can change your infrastructure a little bit, there's a workaround. Let's say you have a website that is a news website, or you have a website that is something like uh, um, an, an auctioning portal where you can buy stuff and the prices change very frequently and the pages appear and disappear relatively quickly, then you might need to make sure that we discover these URLs and uh, index your content quicker. You might have trouble changing your code or making it hybrid, so what, what can you do? Well, what we can do is, if a regular user using a regular browser comes to your website, you just give them the regular client-side rendered app, no problem. 
But if a crawler comes, and there are crawlers that do not support JavaScript at all, Googlebot does, as we have explained earlier, or we have learned earlier, but other search engines or social media crawlers do not run JavaScript. So if you use a, let's say, the bird site um, to, to like share content with your users um, and want to have like the nice little metadata that does like a preview image and stuff, then if that is all behind the client side rendered single page app, that's not gonna work. Because they don't execute JavaScript. They only see the script tags and the empty HTML and go, I don't know. So you need something like that for other bots specifically, and you can also get some performance uh, improvements or speed improvements for indexing in Googlebot as well. So what we do here when the, when the crawler comes to our server is we send the same code as we would send to a user into what we call the renderer, which is a headless browser like headless Chrome, um, for instance or hypothetically PhantomJS, but I think that's discontinued now. And then the renderer, being a regular browser, executes the JavaScript and produces static HTML. And this is nice because this is basically server-side rendering and um, the crawler still gets the, the content that it needs, even though we are missing out on the usability or user experience improvements that we have if we do hybrid rendering. So it's not really a good solution, it is a workaround. Dynamic rendering is definitely a workaround. If you want to learn more about that, we have documentation available uh, on our dev site, so developers.google.com slash search slash doc slash guide slash dynamic dash rendering. No, sorry, get dash started dash with uh, whatever. Um, just use that short link. It's convenient. Basically, what you can use is um, things like Puppeteer, which is a Node.js uh, package that you can use to remote control a uh, headless Chrome. There's also a Python port of that one. Or you use Rendertron, which is basically like a ready-made solution that you can drop into most of your, your um, server stacks. Then there are a few things that I keep seeing developers tap into accidentally, and I would like to prevent that. So one thing is URLs are kind of important because they're pretty much the public API that you offer your users, right? It's not really an API because the user is on the other side, but still it's an interface for people can bookmark these things, they can share these things, whatever. So URLs traditionally are a host, example.com in this case, and then some path. They might also contain this. This is the fragment identifier, the hash, uh, as it's sometimes referred to. The fragment identifier is used to identify or address a piece of existing content. So basically, I have a bunch of content, maybe a Wikipedia page with lots of subheadings and, and uh, sections, and then this is like one section of that long page. So the content has to be there originally, and then we can jump to a specific part of that content. However, eventually when we said like, okay, so now we've got Ajax, so we can like load stuff in the background asynchronously, we would like to be able to navigate between different URLs without having to reload the page entirely. And the first and only way we had at the beginning to do that, the first way to build single page applications was to abuse this hash identifier because we get an event about it, so we can basically figure out when the hash changes, and then we can download new content from a backend, and then show that content uh, asynchronously without refreshing the entire page. Which was great, it was a huge step forward, but it broke the system, because this basically was never intended to be addressing content that isn't there in the first place. We are now using something, abusing something, to load new, fresh content under a URL where this content normally doesn't exist. So many crawlers, all crawlers that I know of, have issues parsing this properly. So I'd rather advise to not do that. Because we have the history API. The history API gives us a proper clean URL, but when this changes, we can change this with JavaScript, we can intercept links, and basically uh, make this change programmatically as well, and the back button works properly, and it just is a nicer way of doing these things. And then I keep hearing, yeah, Martin, that's very nice and fine, but you know, we have to support older browsers, and I'm like, Okay, but look, it goes down to Internet Explorer 11, and Opera Mini is something that you wouldn't worry about that much because that's the browser specifically for people who are conscious on, on how the performance, battery life, and network uh, usage looks like on their phones. It's mostly for low-end mobile phones, um, and they don't really want the JavaScript magic, so they're pretty happy if you just give them a link that reloads the page, that is fine. They still get to their content. Everything works as expected but they don't have to deal with like, all the JavaScript weirdness that you probably uh, use. And the same goes for older browsers uh, like Internet Explorer 8, who is still using an Internet Explorer 8 
some people in the bank on a really old computer probably. Are they happy to have content that just reloads the page? Yes. Are they happy to have a, a single page application experience where the JavaScript makes their computers really slow? Hell no, because they work in a the bank. They have it hard enough already. So I've worked in banks. I know how this feels. So you know, um, I, can, I can vouch for this. Another thing that we see, uh, especially happening in single page applications, is, and I fell for this very often, and I wasn't even aware of this being a problem, is what we call soft 404s. Basically, in this case, the route that was triggered um, is not actually configured properly, so the catch all around fires and shows me an oops page. This is not really content. If I would find this page somewhere in the search results for a specific puppy that has been removed from the database, and I get that, I would be pretty disappointed. You don't want to see that. What you want to see is the actual thing, or don't show me the URL in the first place. So this problem is that this particular page serves us an HTTP 200 OK. But this is not OK. This is, there's something went wrong there. This is not good news. So use HTTP statuses properly. In a single page application, what you can do is, I mean, there must be a component. There must be a route that renders this, right? So in that case, what you can do there is things have gone wrong anyways. So you might as well reload the page entirely and do that so that you get to the server. And the server can then respond with a 404 and say, like, I don't know what this URL is. I'm very sorry for you. So we get a proper HTTP status. Now, you want to use 404 or 410 if the page is no longer there. There are a few people who say like, yeah, but if it's, if it's really gone, gone and not going to come back, use a 410 and only if it's like an accident, then use 404. No, it's, it doesn't matter. Like, honestly, no, it doesn't, doesn't make a difference. Um, but you don't want to do that if, so a lot of people are like changing their site or changing the URLs or maybe move to a new domain or something like that and then forget about all the URLs that they already have in the internet that people are linking to, that search results are pointing to, all that goodness. And then you really want to make sure that you give us a redirect for these. Set up redirects. Why? I'd like to make an example. Imagine you are coming to Zurich. And you have asked me, Martin, what is a good place to go to eat sushi in Zurich? Which, no, well, this, that makes no sense. What is a good place to eat fondue in Zurich? And I say, well, you know, uh, I don't know, Gustl's Fondue Stube or something like that, and it's there and there, and it's fantastic. And you're like, cool, oh my, okay, nice. So you go there, but there is no Gustl's Fondue Stube. There is a laundromat. But I don't want to do my laundry. I want to eat fondue. But at the point where I gave the, the um, recommendation to, there is no fondue. But you see, on the other side of the street, there's a Gustl's Fondue Stube. But it's, wait. So, or maybe not on the other side of the street, maybe one street further. So it doesn't matter. But the point is like, so the recommendation was for this place, but it's not here. Is this place over there the thing that Martin recommended? Or is that a different place? Is that good? Can I, is the recommendation valid for that place? Can I trust that place? I don't know. But imagine you come to the place with a laundromat, but there's a little piece of paper in the window that says, we have moved. We are right behind you on the other side of the street, Gustl's Fondue Stube. Then you're like, ah, nice, all right, cool, whatever. And don't really like, lose a sweat about it because you're like, yeah, that, you're cool. OK, uh, it, it was here. It's now over there. Martin recommended it. Noise. And you go over there. It's the same with the search engine. We, we collect so much information on how good and fast and nice your website is for ranking you between uh, different other websites competing for the same content. So if you are like, removing content and make it pop up somewhere else, then we're like, OK, this one's gone. Sad. Oh, look, there's a new page over there. Are these two related? Probably not. There's no redirection in place. So we're like, we disregard everything we know about this URL and treat this other URL as something that has never been seen before. That's not good. All the information is gone. That's sad. But if you redirect us, we're like, OK, so does this information, like, does the content look like what it was before? Yes. Is it still like as good? Yeah, it looks like it. Okay, cool. So we we can like just move the record over and we'll be good. So you win. You win by basically keeping us um, 
informed about this move. So make sure to use that. And obviously, if things are going fine, then you just give us a 200 or one of the 200 ranges, and then we'll just index it as normal. If you give us a 404 for something that is content, we're not going to index it, because you told us there's nothing there to index. So make sure to use proper HTTP statuses. They matter a lot. OK. Next one is an interesting one um, that I only recently found out that is, it is an issue for many developers, actually, which surprises me, but that's OK. Um, I want to help not making that mistake. Imagine your browser goes to the home page of your website, and the server responds with your single page application. And then it runs from JavaScript, and then we click on a link. So the, Java, sorry, the JavaScript can be like either using history API or hash-based routing, doesn't really matter that much, or it can use the service worker under the hood so that it doesn't actually do anything in the, in the regular JavaScript thread. And, and then I click a link, let's say to slash about. And what happens now is that my single page application usually intercepts this network request. So the server doesn't know anything about it, and some JavaScript makes sure that I get the content without a full page refresh, and the content shows up in the browser, and it looks like everything's fine, and everything's cool. But now I share this link, the slash about link, with a friend of mine who's never been to the home page. So their browser doesn't have this JavaScript and asks the server, hey, can I get the slash about page, please? But the server is not configured properly. So it goes, uh, what? I don't know. I don't have this page. And this is what can happen to Googlebot as well. If you test by just clicking on your links and go like, yeah, it looks, looks fine, deploy. And then Googlebot goes straight to the links that we discovered. Because Googlebot does not actually click on your links. What we do is like, there's a URL in here. That is cool. So hey, we put that in the queue. And at a later point, the crawler goes, oh, there's a URL. It has forgotten everything in between. It is stateless. We have cleared the cookies. We have removed service workers. We have like, cleared the local storage. Everything is as if it would be a fresh browser. So make sure to not fall into that trap. Make sure to configure and test your server configuration properly. That depends on your server configuration and the, the hosting provider as well. So the, the solutions for this look very different between, let's say, like search.sh and uh, Google Cloud Platform. How to do these things um, differs. Also, please use proper links. What is a proper link? A proper link is an anchor tag that has an href that points to a URL that is a proper URL. OK? So please do that. It's OK to like, have um, an href and a change page at the same time. What's not OK is if this is like just an on-click handler, or if it's not even a freaking anchor tag. I mean, why? Why? You type three more characters than you had to. This is more work. Don't do this, OK? Also not cool is if the href is like a, a, a hash or an empty thing or a JavaScript colon thing. No, just give us a proper URL. So please refrain from the other ones. Either use this, or if it's a single page application, go for this. What the hell? Don't do that. Um, so yeah, use proper links, because that way we can actually discover them. If you use any of the other ones, then we might actually go like, oh, there's something fishy here. Let's not index that URL. And that's not what you want. Also, a few people have done this mistake. And uh, it is a nasty one, because it looks, on the surface, it looks fine. So we have a single page application. And you go to a URL. And we don't know if this is actually a valid URL. Let's say like you have a shop with products. And you go to slash products slash one to three. At this point, the server doesn't know if this product exists, because the only thing that happens is in the client side, the JavaScript kicks in and asks the backend for the information on this product. So the server goes like, I don't know, so probably 200. We are good. And then the client side JavaScript goes, right, we are not sure about this, but let's, let's check. Oh no, the server comes back and says there is no such product. So then we produce a soft 404, because we basically say 200, and then we say, oh, we don't have a product here. So someone came up with saying, wait, there's this meta tag that's called robots. And then we use this robots meta tag and say no index, which means Google won't index this page, so we won't have a soft 404. And then we use JavaScript. Once we have the response from the back end with the product information, we use this response to actually remove that meta tag dynamically. And then Google is going to index it, and we'll be fine, right? So that's, that's the strategy here. Sounds good at first. And this is what you would do, right? This, what's the problem with this? Come on, this is not hard. We have the meta tag. We say no index, don't index this page. And then we use some JavaScript to remove that. 
Not very complicated to implement. Do not do this. I don't know why you're taking a picture. Do not <laughs> do this. Because this is going to be a disaster. This is going to be pretty terrifyingly bad. Why is that? Well, the crawler gets a URL, any URL, any product URL, gives us the HTML, and the processor goes, ah, you don't want this in the index. Cool. All right, I think we're done here, because why would we render or index this, right? Because come on, like, you told us not to index this, so eh, whatever. Next URL, please. And we're done here. That means the JavaScript never ran. Ah, so that means you have now unindexed your entire page, which is probably not really what you wanted to do. If a substantial amount of your paid traffic, like people buying stuff in your shop, comes from search, that can hurt you badly. So don't do that. Also, sometimes content is missing, and oftentimes that is because someone shipped something that Googlebot doesn't understand. Googlebot runs... Chrome 41, which is three years old, so it can walk and talk at this point. It is about to go to kindergarten, I believe. So, yeah, um, we are working on fixing that. We are working on getting uh, up to speed with Chrome releases, but so far, that's not the case. So make sure that you transpile back to ES5 and make sure that you're not using features that you're not having in Chrome 41. We have documentation on that as well. If you go to our documentation website on developers.google.com slash search, uh, there is something that outlines all the features that we are not supporting. So how can I debug my site? So now I have a site and it's not performing the way I want it to perform. What can I do about it? Well, the best first stop is to go to go g.co slash mobile friendly. This is a mobile friendly test. The obvious thing that it does is it tells you if your page is mobile friendly or not. Great. That's helpful. But what I also like is it shows you how your page would look rendered. It has a little bug right now. You can't scroll in this, unfortunately. But basically, if your content shows up here, you should be fine. If, you if your page there is blank, you should look into why. How can you do that? Well, first things first, we show you if we have not downloaded any parts of your page. So if you have accidentally excluded us from seeing your JavaScript files, you would see that here. But you also get a full console log, so you hear Get like the error, the, the typical one, uncalled type error, undefined is not a function, great. And you get a stack trace and you get where in the file it is. If it's a minified file, that doesn't help. But as you can see, I use a development URL using ngrok here. So I basically proxy my local development server to the internet and use that to test what Google would see if it would be trying to um, crawl and render my page. This doesn't get your URLs indexed, though. This is literally just a debug tool. It also shows you what kind of markup we see after we rendered. So if you are not seeing us seeing your links, you can check if that's still fine. Like if there's like any anchor tag that is not an anchor tag but a span, that would be a good hint um, for this to not work. Or if there's anything that doesn't get rendered into the HTML um, because of whatever reason, then you would see that here as well. Another cool thing is the search console. You have to verify that you own the domain because you get a lot of interesting data about your domain, but basically you can do that by either uploading some HTML, um, adding a meta tag to your page, or uh, making a DNS change, or if you use Google Analytics already, you can basically, we know that you own that domain to begin with, right? So we can give you some more information. And we show you why pages, which pages are indexed, which pages are not, why are they not indexed, um, are there any issues or penalties? So if you do spammy things, if you do terrible, terrible crimes against Google search, um, we might remove you from the ranking and you'll figure out why here. You also got search analytics so you can see what have people typed into search that brought them to my website. <coughs> that helps you um, identify if you're using the right words. If you have content, if you have a page for something that someone looks for already, which is pretty handy. It also gives you what we call the URL inspection. So you can just like give us any URL in, within your domain and we'll have a look at if it's in the index, if it has been crawled, when it has been crawled, why it's not in the index, all sorts of things. And you can also live test, which means we basically like try to fetch it again and give you updated information on how you're indexed or why you're not indexed. And with that, I'd like to close, I think a little over time. I'm very sorry if that happens. No? Okay. Yay. So in that case, um, there's a bunch of documentation that you can check out at your own will. Uh, we also do uh, webmaster hangouts, so if you want to ask my boss or me a question, 
Every now and then we do a hangout that you can just dial in and ask us questions right away. There's also what we call the Webmasters Forum. Highly recommend that one. Um, there you have a bunch of experts that can help you with your problems in a public way. Please don't come to me and say like, my website's not ranking, what can I do? My answer will be, I can't help you. Please go to the documentation, use the tools that we provide, or ask something in the forums or in the Hangouts. If you have specific technical questions, I might be able to answer them if this is public knowledge. Thank you very much for listening. Um, you can also find me on Twitter. I'll be around the rest of the day, so please come by and talk to me. Thank you so much. We do have time for questions, which is good. That's right. Thank and you, there's Martin. There's one already. And uh, yeah, so put up your hand if you have a question. So as long as you're not like having a table that shows pictures of dogs and then after five minutes you show pictures of dongs um, or boats or something else, then you would be fine. Uh -huh. Cloaking is really only for spammy usage where you would mislead the user. If it's updated information, that is absolutely okay. okay cool. cool. And then there was a question over there. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Uh, Sorry, at yeah. the beginning you said there were like uh, more than 100 factors affecting the page. Yeah. My question is, for example, I know that HTTPS help. How does it help really? Mm -hmm. Those micro formats, so making your site easier to be forwarded by Google help. Does index map help? This kind of stuff. You mean you mean site map? So the question is, with over 200 uh, ranking factors being involved, um, do certain ones definitely help or not? And how can you confirm where right. is the real documentation? Right. <laughs> so how can you confirm that certain things really work or not? Um, generally speaking, we don't lie in the documentation. If we say these things help you, that means they do help you. We're not making shit up. We won't make shit up. Everything that you can't find in the documentation is likely guesswork and made up shit. So um, there is if you go to developers.google.com slash search, there's plenty of documentation for many of the things that you have mentioned. Sitemaps do help us because we parse them and we, if you give us the URLs that we should be crawling, we can queue them right away for crawling. So that definitely helps discovery of these URLs. Great. That's one thing that definitely helps. HTTPS. We are saying HTTPS is great for um, users' privacy protection and uh, speed and security because you have a bunch of features only available on, on uh, SSL. It also definitely helps because it gives us a signal that you are taking care of communicating safely with the, with the client. Um, but again, that's one of 200 factors. You won't see gigantic wins there. It is a good thing. You always win with that. But definitely, it's not. if you are not ranking well because your content is crap, as I said, content is king. If your content isn't good, none of the technical matters will help you. Not a sitemap, not, uh, uh, not HTTPS, not structured data. Structured data specifically, as is documented very much in, de in depth and detail, um, helps you because we can then parse your website better and provide what we call rich snippets. Rich snippets are when you search for a recipe, for instance, and you see like this little carousel where we have like ratings and the ingredients and the preparation time and the name of the recipe. So if you have that kind of data, recipes, events, books, uh, articles, whatever, if you have one of the kinds of data that we are supporting in rich snippets, they definitely help you be more prominent on the search results. Potentially, if we think that your website is relevant enough. So again, your content is what makes the biggest difference at, at all. If you want to verify that, there's also a tool that we call Rich Results Test. Rich Results Test uh, can be checked or can be used to make sure that your markup is correct. According to, to structured data, schema.org. That's sad because we implement the schema.org implementations. Yeah, but you make some stuff. Whatever, that, let's take that offline. Okay. You can continue the discussion outside. Thanks a lot for your talk. Thank you.